And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up, and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumour of him went forth throughout all Judea, and throughout all the region round about, and the disciples of John shewed him all of these things. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus, answering, said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Thanks, Derek. I just realised, looking at my notes, that I haven't put a, a title over this. I mean, chiefly, of course, it has to do with the widow of Nain and her son, but there is, we are going to look a little bit at uh, John the Baptist and his query as well. So just reading verse 11 again then. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. A city of Nain uh, is southwest of Galilee, about 10 to 15 miles or so. Um, about three miles, um, I think, southwest of a place called Endor. If you're familiar with the story of uh Saul going to consult with the witch is called the witch of Endor uh, so that's mentioned in the Old Testament there but about 9 about 15 miles 10 to 15 miles southwest of Galilee and we read here in verse uh, verse 11 many of his disciples went with him and much people so some clearly followed him physically who were not his disciples uh, and so it is today out of curiosity perhaps people will follow Jesus for a little while or maybe as is the case with so many in the hope of some material prosperity but sadly very often not for the love of the truth and such people don't tend to stay the distance you'll see them fall away uh, you'll see them come into churches wherever you go they'll stay a while and then the uh, attendance will drop off and eventually you'll see them no more uh, but those that love the truth, when they hear the truth, they want the truth, they keep coming for the truth. Mm. And uh, you remember the Lord Jesus said on one occasion, um, Will ye also go away? It was John chapter 6. And Peter said, To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And it's always been my thought, you know, that sometimes the way gets hard. But where else is there to go? There's only one place to find the truth, and it's in the Lord Jesus. Verse 12 then, reading on, Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. She was a widow. Uh, it's been my experience, and it's taught in the scriptures, that God has a care for widows. Um, Job in chapter 29 speaks of his happier days before his sickness when he served God if you want to look with me for a moment just at a word there in Job 29 
so it's a it's a lovely uh chapter and so much of christ in it but uh he, from verse one we won't read it all but he's talking about the happier days if you will when uh <coughs> things went well with him before this terrible illness afflicted him and in verse 13 we read the blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me and i caused the widow's heart to sing for joy have a look also at first kings going to the left from job first kings chapter 17 this is a chapter in which elijah first appears on the scene first um, kings chapter 17 and verse 9 you remember that elijah prays that there might be no rain for three and a half years and then the lord feeds him by the brook kirith and then in verse uh, 8 of chapter 17 of first kings and the word of the lord came unto him saying arise get thee to zarephath which belongeth to zidon and dwell there behold i have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee so he sends elijah to this widow woman during the famine and she feels that it's almost up with her as it were and then god miraculously provides for her and for her son have a look at james chapter one right to the back of your bible now a couple of books in from the end james chapter one more than a couple of books of course three or four books james chapter one and verse 27 pure religion and undefiled before god and the father is this to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world <coughs> you'll often hear christians born again christians saying uh, i'm not religious uh, there's a difference between religion and salvation but it's not strictly biblical because james says pure religion and undefiled before god and the father is this uh to be able to speak in tongues does he say no he doesn't say that to be able to preach well no he doesn't say that he says to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world so here we have the mention of widows again and just highlighting as it often is the case in the bible god's care for widows now a bit further on we read and we'll look at it a little bit later of all the miracles that jesus did in verse 22 the blind see the lame walk the lepers are cleansed and so forth and so we have a great many miracles here in verse 22 all spoken of as it were at once uh, but there are frequently miracles and wonders and healings that are spoken of in detail such as the centurion servant which we studied last week and this story here about the widow of nain and her son we have much more detail um, and I, I think we see here, you may disagree and that's fine, I think here there is a picture actually of God's plan for Israel. Have a look with me at chapter 18 of Luke and I'll try and tell you, explain to you why I think that. Chapter 18 of Luke, I see in the widow of Nain and her son a picture of Israel and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 18 verse 1 and he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God neither regarded man and there was a widow in that city and she came unto him saying avenge me of mine adversary and he would not for a while but afterward he said with himself Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth so we have a widow here that the story is being told of course the point of the parable is to teach us not to give up in prayer but we have a widow coming to the judge and it is connected with the return of the lord and shall not god avenge his own elect so the widow is a picture of god's elect and the elect 
in the and the widows in the Bible are frequently Israel, as we see in a moment. The church is not a bride. Sorry, the church is not a widow. To make the church a widow is to violate the New Testament teachings of the Apostle Paul. Israel is a widow, the church is a bride. So what we're seeing here is a foretelling of the time, and the Lord makes that clear. Shall not the Lord avenge his own elect? He's talking about a widow, he's talking about Israel. Have a look at me at Lamentations. Lamentations, chapter 1. I love the book of Lamentations. It's very, very painful, powerful, stark. It tells of the dreadful destruction of Jerusalem. But it it's a strange thing it's, it's, it tells this awful destruction in the most exquisite prose and I'm often just blown away by the beauty of this chapter even though the things that are spoken of in themselves are absolutely dreadful but look at Lamentations it's immediately after Jeremiah and verse chapter 1 how, now let me just explain what these lamentations are about Jeremiah has been warning the people of Jerusalem that the Babylonians are going to come except they repent the Babylonians are going to come Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and he's going to destroy them and that happens at the end of the book of Jeremiah and now we have the state of the city afterwards told in the most amazing language that Shakespeare would envy verse 1 chapter 1 how doth the city sit solitary that was full of people listen how is she become as a widow she that was great among the nations and princess among the provinces how is she become tributary she weepeth sore in the night and her tears are on her cheeks among all her lovers she had none to comfort her all her friends have dealt treacherously with her they are become her enemies judah is gone into captivity because of affliction and because of great servitude she dwelleth among the heathen she findeth no rest all her persecutors overtook her between the straits and it just goes on the ways of zion do mourn because none come to the salafis it's beautiful language and yet beautiful language telling the most dreadful story but verse one how is she become as a widow this is jerusalem and judah has become as a widow have a look with me at isaiah chapter 54 isaiah chapter 54 uh, verse 4 fear not the lord speaking to jerusalem to israel fear not for thou shalt not be ashamed neither be thou confounded for thou shalt not be put to shame for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. So the Lord here, speaking to Israel, says thy maker is thine husband. And says in verse 4, uh, shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. You will not find the church called a widow in the New Testament. Israel is the widow, the church is the bride. So I see then in this parable, this rather this story that we're reading in, this account that we're reading in Luke 7, maybe a suggestion of Israel in a time of widowhood, if you will. A son uh, has died, and that speaks to me of the Lord Jesus now you might say well you've got your how can that be jesus when jesus is going to raise him from the dead perhaps i need to if you think for a moment about the story of the the blind man in john 9 here we have a man who's been blind from birth the lord comes with his disciples you remember he makes the clay he puts it on his eyes he sends him to the pool he washes him in the pool and he comes back seeing now that's a picture of salvation and although the lord jesus is doing that I believe what we see there in the clay broken is, is God's, God, as it were, sent Christ down to earth, made clay, because our bodies are clay, he took a body of clay, broke it, that's what happened at the cross, applies that to the blind man's eyes, the cross of Christ, the broken body of Christ, applied to our eyes, and we see. 
So there's a story of salvation. So all well, the Lord Jesus is doing this, he's picturing the work of the Father through the Son. And I think we see the same thing here uh, with this widow. The, the young man speaks of the Lord Jesus and God's gonna, God has raised him, of course, and he will restore uh, Israel and, and, and uh, restore the Son, as it were, to the widow. The day is coming when the nation of Israel and the Lord Jesus shall be united Zechariah if you'd like to look with me Zechariah chapter 12 Zechariah 12 and verse 10 uh, let's read verse 9 so you can see where we are historically it's the coming of the Lord and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that's not the church, that's Jews, that's Israel, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one, that is in bitterness, for his firstborn. So the spirit here is poured upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. That's a reference to their rejection of Christ and they shall mourn for him. In other words, they realize this mourning uh, is recognizing their guilt over Calvary. Now also, if we go back to our chapter, Luke and chapter, uh, chapter seven and the, and the 12th verse again, we read now when he was he came nigh to the gate of the city behold there was a dead man carried out the only son of his mother and she was a widow and much people of the city was with her so there was there was compassion for her from the people of the city and yet still helpless against death have a look at john's gospel chapter 11 please story of lazarus john's gospel chapter 11 and verse 19 this is after Lazarus has died verse 19 John 11 and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother so we find that much people follow this widow out of Nain we find that many Jews came to comfort um, it says many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them and I suppose it's fair to say there is a measure of comfort in human compassion but death still prevails ultimately I'm sure that the women most of them that work for Marie Curie or whatever they call themselves is very I'm sure that many of them really have a care and a compassion not all sadly not all nurses do these days some of them are, are proper animals but nevertheless there are those that have a vocation to care and no doubt they care but there's a limit to what they can do uh, in the end sadly death prevails and it strikes me how much more sociable comparatively were these small New Testament cities many people today in, in a great city like Birmingham die alone with almost no one to mourn in cities ten times in a city ten times the size of Nain or perhaps even Jerusalem as it used to be and uh, we, we're just, we've lost because of the growth, the great cities that we live in, we've lost this sense of social life. And I've been to funerals where there's been four people there, five people there. Someone's died maybe in their 80s or 90s. Of course, the older you get, the more you get forgotten. You'll find that out when you get older, should the Lord tarry. The older you get, the less the phone rings. You can always tell, you know, it's almost... Um, you can almost make it an axiom that the, the number of times the phone, phone rings is in inverse proportion to how old you are. <laughs> when I was a young man, you know, my, my phone used to ring and the door used to, the doorbell used to go and are you coming here? Are you going? It changes when you get married. You, you probably found that out already. It changes when you get married because all your young mates, they are having a good time out of the pub and you're married now, you know, you, you're staying at home with early doors. Nothing wrong with that. But as you get older, um, those friends fall away very often, saved or lost, and many, many old people are very lonely, but that's just by the way. Verse 13 then, continuing, And the Lord saw her, 
he had compassion on her and said unto her weep not have a look at Judges chapter 10 please Judges chapter 10 Judges chapter 10 that's just after Joshua of course uh, Judges is a seventh book in your Bible chapter 10 just reading one verse there verse 16 and they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel so the Lord was touched with the, the trials of Israel which they brought upon themselves by their unbelief go to Jeremiah chapter 31 Jeremiah 31 So that's after Isaiah, Psalms and Isaiah, then you've got Jeremiah chapter 31. Verse 15. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rahel weeping for her children refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears for thy work shall be rewarded saith the Lord and they shall come again from the land of the enemy just pointing out here that the Lord uh, sees the tears of his people and he has compassion here upon this widow woman verse 14 and he came and touched the bier and they that bear him stood still and he said young man I say unto thee arise now sometimes the Lord if I can say this reverently sometimes in the Bible the Lord is a party pooper when wickedness is afoot as for example when Moses came down from the mountain and they were having a great time they've got their calf set up and they were singing and dancing and eating and drinking and Moses came down from the mountain and put an end to the festivities in short order Sometimes the Lord's a party pooper, as when, for example, Je Jeroboam had set up his golden calf, one in Dan and one in Bethel, and he was what a king should not do, that the kings were kings and the priests were priests and the prophets were prophets, and as a general you were anointed to one of those offices in the New Testament, never two and never three, although David was a prophet and a, and a king. Um, but Jeroboam the king of Israel after the division of the kingdom he set up his calf in, in Bethel the southern city and uh, he's worshipping this calf and no doubt many people were there and he's offering incense and then comes a man of God from Judah a party pooper he comes in the spirit of the Lord and he comes with a word from the Lord and rebukes I mean it takes some courage to do that and you know sometimes there are men that will stand up in the most godless situations that will stand up and rebuke what's going on you might have seen the man maybe who stood up in one of Joel Austin's services place was absolutely packed to the gunnels and a man stood up and rebuked Joel Austin from the scriptures <laughs> praise the Lord for a guy with guts like that and sometimes it happens and this man of God from Judah was such a man and the Lord was a party pooper why because wickedness was afoot but here it's the opposite here's a time of great sorrow and the Lord comes in to the situation and turns it into a time of great rejoicing. I remember a brother that used to come and preach in the first church I was in and he was dynamite. Great preacher, Pentecostal man, but he was a great preacher. Loved the Bible, really could preach with some power. And uh, he said in one occasion he came to preach to us and he said he'd been to a funeral that afternoon. He said and we were singing and praising the Lord. He said after all he said death's only a hiccup in eternity. And he said it was a great service, it was a great funeral because the, the, the person was saved and there were many saved relatives and friends there. There was great rejoicing that had gone on to the glory. Now, we never know, of course, what it, when it may please the Lord or what it may please the Lord to do when we're in trials and we should be careful to be of a doubtful mind. You find this sometimes, you know, people are saying, don't bother the master anymore and the Lord will say the Lord just kind of overrules that and says be not unbelieving and sometimes people are so quick we're so inclined to negativity it just comes so naturally to us to always think the worst I know a, a man who tried to commit suicide 
and the Lord graciously spared him and uh, one of an another brother said to me after and he tried he tried the next day and another brother said to me afterwards you know usually when they try like that they'll they'll see, succeed in the end and I thought to myself don't you be so sure if the Lord's rescued him twice there's no there's no promise that he's got no guarantee he's going to do it again we, we need to be careful about saying such and such you know we all like to play the part of a prophet and usually he's negative so I'll tell you what's going to happen you always people I'll tell you what will happen we hear this all the time and people really for the most part haven't got a clue what's going to happen and we always tend to think the worst and no doubt this woman may have thought it was all over and and yet the Lord came into the situation and just turned everything on its head a wonderful wonderful day for her now there's a picture of salvation here of course we once were dead in trespasses and sins as we read in the Ephesian letter and, and it says there you and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins so that's a picture being told here too remember I think it was before I was saved actually a woman came into the shop once or did we I think we might have emptied a house actually we had this junk shop being a friend I think we may have emptied a house and the person was a believer and there were two pictures that I'd, we'd put up in the shop from, from Bible accounts and one of them was this story I can't remember what the picture looked like but the text underneath was young man I say unto thee arise and I thought to myself when I got saved that's just what the Lord said to me it's just what the Lord has said to me it was the Saviour's authoritative word that raised that young man and it is still his authoritative word in the scriptures that brings life today the words that I speak to you said the Lord Jesus they are spirit and they are life that's why I believe evangelism should be with the word of God our business is to preach and sow the word of God the sower says the Lord Jesus soweth the word I've never been one for gimmicks and gadgets I've never been one for shiny stuff you know ventriloquist dummies and all that junk and paraphernalia if some men can justify themselves before the Lord that's between them and the Lord but I believe the sower soweth the word our business is to preach the word of God our business is to sow the word of God because they are the words of life and when the Lord speaks people get saved this is why Paul says to Timothy preach the word just by the way here George Williams comments death is not so mighty as the sinner's friend verse 15 then and he that was dead sat up and began to speak and he delivered him to his mother he sat up and began to speak when God's word comes to you with power and sadly and regrettably in so many churches these days it rarely does but when it comes with power it will make you sit up <laughs> it will be. sometimes you might be reading it and suddenly something will come with force and it will make you sit up and it will make you speak he that was dead sat up and began to speak let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy says Psalm 107 have a look at Psalm 40 with me for a moment Psalm 40 verse 9 was I say in the black country verse 9 verse 9 I have preached righteousness in the great congregation lo I have not refrained my lips O Lord thou knowest I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great, great congregation when God's word comes with power it will make you sit up and it will make you speak we have a story to tell we believers how God took us from the dunghill opened our eyes to see the saviour forgave us all our sins walks with us and thank God for this walks with us every moment of every day and the older I get the more I need that that sense of his moment by moment not just day by day not just be week by week not even just hour by hour but moment by moment he's with me he has promised I will never leave thee nor forsake thee we have a story to tell 
Uh, God took us from the dunghill, opened our eyes to see the Saviour, forgave us all our sins, walks with us every moment here every day, and will soon come and take us to be with himself. We can keep looking at the mess around us and we can get despondent. We need to keep looking up and realise that the Saviour will soon come. He that was dead sat up and began to speak. You remember when uh, Lazarus died and, and Mary came uh, and Jesus came to Bethany and Mary came out and spoke of the resurrection and she said, I know he will rise at the last day and Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. It's not a day on the calendar, it's a person. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me for a moment to Second Kings chapter 13. Second book of Kings chapter 13. We'll just read one verse here. Don't really have time to go into all the background of it. Second Kings 13. And verse 21. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, that, behold, they spied a band of men. And they cast the man into the sepulchre of Elisha, and when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. So here's a man who's dead, that are about to bury him. It says they spied a band of men, presumably these were robbers of some sort, so they quickly put the body and touches the bones of Elisha, and he revive, Elisha, and he revives and stands upon his feet. He has life because of the death of Elisha just as we have life because of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a look at Romans 6. Romans 6. It was the death of Elisha, if you will, that gave that man life, and it's the death of Christ that gives life to us. Chapter 6 of Romans, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ, that's not water, by the way, that's not water. You can't get into Jesus Christ by being dipped in tap water. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, if we have touched his bones, if you will, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now it says in verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead. Now that doesn't mean from the state of death. It means from among the dead ones. The word death in Greek here is plural. And it means that Jesus was raised up from among the dead ones. And, uh, and then it goes on in verse um, 5 to say, We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Which means Christians too will be raised from among the dead ones. We're not all raised at the same time. There is not, as the reformers used to preach, and for all I know still do, one general resurrection. There is a resurrection of the just and there is a resurrection of the lost. And the just will be raised at the rapture, we read in 1 Thessalonians 4. The dead in Christ shall rise, says Paul. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. And he says we, because he included himself in that, because he expected the rapture, out from among the dead. There's more than one resurrection. The first, I say, is at the rapture. The dead in Christ shall rise. And the second is at the great white throne. Revelation 20.12 says, And I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were open they're called the dead in Revelation 20 they're those who sleep in 1 Thessalonians 4 because Christians in that sense death is over for the Christian you, you die physically but really you just sleep whereas those in the great white throne I saw the dead it says small and great stand before God reading on then in our chapter verse 16 and there came a fear on all and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. There came a fear on all. It's quite striking how often 
we find that the Lord performs a miracle, a healing, and you find that people are afraid. You find this quite frequently, we won't look at all the references, but there are quite a few of them, that they saw him do something wonderful. For example, when he cast the demons out of the, the Gadarene demoniac and they went into the swine, and all the swine ran off the cliff and the people from the city came out, he says they were afraid of him and asked him to leave. Um, and, and the great distance of time, I suppose, from the events here, uh, from there to here, inclines perhaps to dull the sense of wonder. We read the most extraordinary things, and yet so often we, we don't, I'm sure we don't, get the sense of wonder that these would have had who actually there, were there and witnessed it. Now, it's, it's not that we don't believe those things. Christians do believe these things, but, but it perhaps cannot be said of us that a great fear came on all. And I believe it's only by the influence of the Holy Ghost that can give us a sense of the marvellous reality of these events. It seems now, I've made these notes, and when I went back to them today, that it's a slight diversion, but I'll say it anyway. Why, why did I become a Christian? And why do I remain a Christian? Because I have seen something of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. My faith in the absolute veracity of the whole of the scriptures revolves around my heart conviction that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Saviour of the world. It begins there for me. I, I began to see, at the time of my conversion, I began to see who Jesus was. And I, I began and I, I believed and I understood that he was the Son of God. And since then, other truths have added themselves on, if you will, and my faith has grown but it began and it remains centred and it should be it's always centred upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So my faith in the absolute veracity of the whole of the scriptures revolves around my heart conviction that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Saviour of the world. If the Lord Jesus spoke the truth, and I am absolutely satisfied that he did, then all Bible history immediately becomes credible. From the Lord's own lips in the Gospel records, he confirms as truth the very stories which unbelievers cavil at, make such a, a fuss about. He confirms, for example, the creation story, the Lord Jesus himself, saying in the beginning God made them male and female. He confirms the destruction of Sodom, saying, quote, the same day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. This is God speaking. Jesus believed these things. He knew these things to be true. He confirms the story of Noah's ark. We won't read the references, but you know that he does that. He confirms the story of Jonah and the whale, saying most specifically, quote, Jonah swath three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So the Lord Jesus believed and preached the Bible. It seems to me that the trouble with unbelievers at the root is they cannot recognise an honest man when they see one. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect honest man and they can read his life and they can't see. Why? Because they are warped themselves. That's why. And everything they look at and everyone they listen to is as warped as they are. And so some of these so-called new atheists, they say God is a monster. I've said this to you before. The problem is, man, you're the monster. That's why you think God's a liar. That's why you think God's, if there is a God, and actually they, they, they know there is. The Bible says they know it. Um, so the root problem with the unbeliever is you can't recognise an honest man. I was watching a clip Never heard of him before, a guy called David Woods, I think. I don't know if you've come across him on YouTube. And he was debating one of these uh, Mohammedan uh, know-it-alls, Shabir Ali. Shabir Ali. And uh, I think someone in the audience asked the question about uh, how could Christ be the saviour when it says, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. How can, how can this be if, if he's cursed? And he mentioned some references, I believe, in the Old Testament. So this guy is addressing David Woods the Christian and Shabir Ali the Mohammedan and the Muslim. And uh, he says, how can this be? And David Wood quite correctly says, well, that's the gospel. Christ was made sin for us. Christ was made a curse for us that we might go through. 
Shabir Ali then says, uh, just just totally misses the point, completely misses. The, I mean, there's the gospel, just misses it as, as far as a, as a man could miss it. And uh, it goes on to say, well, Paul got it wrong. Of course, notice this and, and note this when you're dealing with Muslims. They'll accept the Gospels up to a point, but they will not accept the writings of Paul. They will not accept the writings of Paul because it's Paul that tells you what Jesus did at the cross. So they talk about honouring the Bible. They only honour some of it. And they're very picky and choosy about what parts of the Gospels they'll accept. But when Paul tells you what Jesus did, they say Paul is, is a liar, Paul's a deceiver, Paul is wrong. Because it's Paul, of course, that says, Curse is everyone that hangeth on the tree. Now, as Christians, we understand that. He that knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took the curse. He didn't deserve it. There was nothing in his nature deserving. He took it. It was imputed to him. It was laid upon him at the cross. And so this Shabir Ali, in an absolute cloud cuckoo land, supposes he's being clever and says that, you know, Paul is wrong and so on. And then I noticed this was a, this was a Muslim channel. And all the comments underneath, I thought to myself, how stupid. And they're all saying how brilliant Shabir Ali is and how stupid David Woods is. I thought to myself, it's just amazing that you believe what you want to believe. We've got to be so careful about that. So easy just to believe what you want to believe and not listen. They haven't got, as we used to say, they haven't got their ears on. And the Lord Jesus, of course, warned about this. Having ears you hear not, having eyes you see not. And that's the problem with the Muslims and it's a problem with so many today. Verse 16. And there came a fear on all and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us and that God had visited his people. A great prophet is risen amongst us. Well, that's true, but it, it doesn't go far enough. You might remember the woman of Samaria, John 4, she said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. When Jesus began to tell her about the men she'd lived with and so forth, and the ones she was living with there, Sir, she said, I perceive that thou art a prophet. But later on she learned a little more, and she said, Is not this the Christ? You remember the blind man in John 9, I mentioned him earlier, for whom the Lord made clay and put it on his eyes. When he was questioned by the Pharisees, he said, he's a prophet. But later on the Lord meets him again and the Lord says to him, dost thou believe on the Son of God? He says, who is he, Lord, that I may believe? And, and then he learns that Jesus is not just a prophet, he's the Son of God. And uh, you find that there are many who see the Lord, as it were, dimly at first but greater light comes afterwards. It's illustrated by Lazarus, we won't turn there, we've mentioned Lazarus a couple of times, who though raised from the dead, we find he comes out with his face bound about with a napkin. He's got saved, but he needs more light. And so the Lord gives another word, loose him and let him go. And then Lazarus receives more light. So when you get saved, you receive light, you discover who Jesus is. But as we go on, if we obey and if we walk in the light that we have received, God keeps on giving more light. Some people are far too impatient with young believers. And uh, I believe that people should be given time to grow. You know, if you've got children and they're one year old, you don't expect them to behave like 18 year olds, you don't clip them around the ear hole every time they don't behave like an 18 year old, you realise they are one and you give them time to grow, now that is not so obviously visible in the spiritual life but too many pastors and too many preachers will not give folks time to grow now I've been in churches where folks have been there for decades and they're still sucking on their dummies spiritually speaking and they're still wearing their nappies and they ought to have grown up years ago but they were not really that much interested in following after the Lord those are a bit more of a problem some of those people are going to go to glory and, and they will if they are saved and many of them sadly are, well, I say sadly thankfully are but sadly have never grown if we walk in the light we have God will give us more light and so it was here they, they said a great prophet, but I'm sure some of them would have learned he was much more than a prophet later. Verse 18, And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. It's John the Baptist, of course. 
Now John at this time is in prison. Uh, you can check that in Matthew 11. He's in prison at this time. And it's worth making the observation that the Lord Jesus never got John out of prison. But he did get Peter, he did get Peter out of prison. Acts chapter 12, miraculously Peter was released from prison. But John wasn't got out of prison, even though the Lord Jesus himself, when Peter came out of prison, the Lord had gone to glory. It was an angel that fetched him out. And though the Lord Jesus had continued John's ministry, he never got John out of prison. We're not all treated identically. The Lord doesn't treat us all exactly the same. And, uh, you know, sometimes your experiences will be different from mine, and that's something else we need to bear in mind when dealing with people. I... Uh, I was out on the road today and uh, my car's a bit dirty and it needs cleaning I've got a test tomorrow I always like to take a test for the clean car but I've been having a few health problems this week and I, I didn't feel well enough and I thought to myself you know I just went through my mind sometimes some instructor will go past me with a filthy dirty car and I'll think to myself shame on him he ought to clean that and then I thought to myself you don't know what other problems he's got it's so easy is it's so easy to find fault with people and you don't know half of the problems that they might have at the present time or, or, or why they came to be the situation they're in but that's just an aside we're not all treated the same but although John was in a great fortress they tell me he was evidently allowed visitors uh, because we find the disciples of John showed him all of these things and in verse 19 calling on him two of his disciples setting them to Jesus so let's read verse 19 John calling unto him, two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? I don't know how long John was in prison. I, I, perhaps I ought to know. Uh, maybe it's in the Bible. I haven't discovered it, but I don't know how long he was there. But maybe he was there a while, and he'd seen no changes in the Roman power. He'd been preaching the kingdom of heaven is nigh. He knew that the Lord Jesus was preaching the kingdom of heaven is high. But here he is languishing in prison. The Ro Caesar is still ruling in Rome. The Romans are still in control in Jerusalem. And uh, I just wonder whether maybe he's overtaken at this point by a fit of doubt. Now I'm speculating, I appreciate that. And I'm speculating about a great man, I appreciate that. But his question seems to suggest as much, art thou he that should, art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? And we need to just remind ourselves if John is having a fit of the doubts here that only the Saviour is perfect. If I meet a brother who tells me he's never sinned, I'd say, show me your hands. Show me your feet. And if there's no nail wounds there, you're kidding. We're, we're, there's nobody perfect but the Saviour. The very, the very finest of saints we, we see fall at times, um, one time or another in the Word of God. I'll just say this as well, it's been on my mind this week, I've got a friend, I was telling you, been a Christian for many years, now he's in psychiatric hospital, tried to commit suicide recently, and I've, his wife's been emailing me a little bit, and it occurred to me that a sense of failure, and this is part of his problem, a sense of failure, maybe John was feeling it in prison, a sense of a wasted life can drive even a Christian to suicide, and certainly into depression and I'm sure that many a Christian who, who falls under falls victim to depression maybe many times it's because of this sense of failure it's a sense of a wasted life and I would just say this you know we cannot change yesterday but God has forgiven us and my friend needs to re remember that he, he can't change yesterday and, and no matter how successful our lives were had we been great spiritual giants, it could still so easily, this could still so easily come upon us, this sense of failure. Elijah had it. Elijah had the blues, uh, you know, the, the, wanted the Lord to take him away. And Elijah had been a giant in Israel. So we can't change yesterday. God has forgiven us. We need to remember that if we have confessed it, he has confessed our sinful past. There's a phrase, there's a, there's a saying I've got written on my blackboard at home, you may have heard it, the moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on, nor all thy, nor all thy piety or wit, 
shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. What's past is past. And it's no good lamenting over it, and it's no good getting depressed over it. It's past. And if we're Christians, God has forgiven us. So we ought not to pine over yesterday, and we ought not to be afraid of tomorrow. Victory in the Christian life is to praise God today. We don't we don't know what's coming tomorrow. And Paul Paul said, "I, I uh, putting aside those things which are behind, forgetting those things which are behind." It's no there's no point dwelling on those things. We can't change them. You know, I might lament over my failures. We could we could all do that. Get into a great fit of self pity. And uh, God expects us. We were saying this. I was saying this on the train down to London. God expects us to man up. We can't change the past. The moving finger writes, and having writ moved on, moves on. Nor all thy piety or wit shall lure thee back to cancel half a line, nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. The Lord Jesus says, "Take no thought for the morrow," and He means that anxious thought for the morrow shall take thought for itself. And again, this week in, in my quiet time one morning. It occurred to me that this is what victory is in the Christian life. It's praising God today. Praising God today. Not lamenting over yesterday, not fearing tomorrow, but praising God today. And asking God, what can I do, Lord, today? God lives in the everlasting now. There is no time, we know this, there is no time with God. He inhabits eternity, the high and lofty one, he calls himself, which inhabiteth eternity. And uh, we need to just try and live I'm not talking that we should be irresponsible, but we need a bit more focus sometimes on where we are today. What can I do for the Lord today? Is there somebody I can bless today? Can I leave a tract somewhere today? Is there somebody that needs a... We're always thinking about doing great things. Is there somebody that needs a touch today? The Lord's been telling me, and she's not here, so I can say it fairly freely, that the first person that I have a responsibility for is my wife. It's my duty to to love her and to seek to reveal Christ to her and to try and give her a happy and a peaceful life. She's the first person I am responsible for. And so often I'll go through the day really without giving any thought about what I might do for her. And then maybe we've got children, you know, uh, or grandchildren. What can we do today? How can we serve God today? Can we be looking, can we be praying for an opportunity to touch someone today for the Lord? And let's get, our, let's get these delusions of grandeur out of our minds. It might be there's just someone that the Lord wants us to bless today. Verses 20 and 21. When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Are thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. So it says in that same hour, in the same hour that John's disciples come, so they witness all these miracles, and then Jesus answering, verse 22, said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. To the poor the gospel is preached it must have been quite something to see that quite something to see that just all comers of all sorts just healed with a word or with a touch and this is a long way removed this verse 22 this is a long way removed from what the charismatics perform who tell us that you know they're doing the, the miraculous works of the Lord these are healings here of every sort and they're instantaneous there is no delay and there is no failure. Not only are there healings, people are being raised from the dead, as was this young man from Nain. Now there are many who follow charismatic preachers. Um, and those people may be saved and well-intentioned, but they're dispensationally out of whack. Uh, the more I go on with the Lord, the more I am sure that signs and wonders are not for today. Gifts is something else, but signs and wonders are not for today. Paul's commission to Timothy, preach the word 
and by extension a commission to modern preachers is a very different thing to the great commission of Matthew 28 and Mark 16 they were told not only to preach the gospel to all the world they were told to go and heal the sick and speak in tongues Paul says nothing of that to Timothy he simply says preach the word so we're, under, we're operating under a different commission or we should be verse 23 finally preached a long time and blessed is he who serveth shall not be offended in me I must try and finish um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave some of this out because time has gone quicker than I thought let's have a look at Matthew 15 and verse 37 and perhaps we'll close with this Matthew 15 and verse 37 have I got the right text I haven't <laughs> give me a moment see if I can find it <clears throat> it might be Luke 15 37 I'm just going to have to trawl through the Gospels because I think the numbers are right no, let's try John no it's not John either let's try Mark <laughs> I'm sorry about this I'll have to quote it to you from memory I think it's the occasion they start in Mark either it's the occasion when um, people say of Jesus it says they were offended in him are not his sisters here with us do not we know his brother is not this the carpenter's son and they were offended in him it says now, so why were they offended the Lord says here in this passage that we've been reading uh, let me get the words right blessed is he who service shall not be offended in me and the Jews were offended over a number of things I'm just going to focus on one because of time they were offended because of his humble background and in their view because of his unacademic background they were offended because as far as they were concerned they were the learned ones they, they'd got the degrees he was a carpenter's son he was a, he was a country boy from, from, Naz from Nazareth of all places and they were offended in modern parlance he was but a lay preacher and even good men at times I've observed use that unscriptural adjective of men like me because I haven't been through theological college and I've never cared to uh, Herbert Rouse says I put my Bible college certificate hanging in the toilet I've never cared. he said I wouldn't cross the street for a degree and uh, I'm not knocking that but you know a brother used to write for, I was right corresponding with a brother in prison in America and he used to say to me let me get this right it was uh, eyes in the Bible uh, it was it nose in the Bible eyes on Jesus knees on the floor and if you want to be, if you know, you want to be a Bible teacher, that's that's the college you want to go to. It's eyes on Jesus, nose in the Bible, knees on the floor, and the Lord can teach us everything we need to know. Um, but that's one of the reasons they were offended. They were offended also, of course, because he was a stumbling block. And I'm going to have to leave this out, but he was a stumbling block. They they thought that they'd be saved by their works, and he was telling them, you know, he was he was preaching his death up to a point, and they couldn't understand that. We'll leave it there for tonight. Amen. Mm -hmm.